what is interesting about this one is that in his personal conversation where he delivers the final truly, truly, I say to you, remember a truly, truly in John's book, it, it'll be true with the others as well, but in John's book, he makes it clear that a very important messianic doctrine that's important to them and the church because they're going to be the apostolic ministry to the early church to establish the church. These doctrines are really, really important. Now, what's interesting about the last one is that it's a personal prophecy. It's a prophecy, a personal prophecy that's given to Peter. And that makes this one really unique, okay? So let's look at verses 18 and 19, and then we'll take a look at this. Uh, truly, truly, I say to you, and he's talking to Peter. We know that from his, pre you know, the previously, Peter, uh, do you love me business. I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself or clothe yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, here's the prophecy, but when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else, caregiver, will clothe you, gird you, and bring you where you do not wish to Go. Welcome to old age. Now that's a personal prophecy to Peter. That's a personal prophecy, prophecy to Peter. Look at verse 19. And this, now he it goes to explain that. Now this he said, signifying by what kind of death or manner of death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. And that's a command. That's a present active imperative. That's a, that's a command. Let's have a word of prayer. We're going to come in back, and we're going to take a look at this. This will probably be a two-lesson. Notice at the top of your paper, this is part one. Um, I'm going to explain this through that. And then I'm going to come back, and I'm going to explain to you a, a phenomenal a biblical concept of aging that's very important for you to know. I don't think I'd get to it today, but I certainly will get to it next Sunday. Uh, this is a subject, everybody's headed that way, everybody's aging. I mean, it may be from 15 to 16 or from 80 to 90, but everybody's aging. And uh, explaining to you from a biblical concept where that concept comes from, I think will be interesting to you. Well, let's have a word of prayer. Uh, Al mentioned uh, Classroom Etiquette. It's a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. It's just that simple, the Bible. Um, you can't study it carnal. As a Christian, you can't study the Bible car carnal. How w what would be evidence of carnality? You know, the carnality I'm talking about, you know, 1 Corinthians 3, uh, 2 and 3, carnality. Uh, how, how would we identify it in our life? Personal sin. It could be mental attitude sins. It could be sins of the tongue or overt sins. And what do I do? Well, 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sin, he, and how, how can I do that? Because 1 Peter 2 says that you're a believer priest. This is the new covenant age in which every believer is a priest, has a priestly duty to the church as well as to himself. And so when he confesses his sin, the work of Christ on the cross is extended to his life in sanctification, not salvation. When you read 1 John 1, 7, he's talking about cleansing for salvation. When he uses the word cleansing in verse 9, he's talking about sanctification. He's talking about returning to the ministry, the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit who lives in you. Confession of sin is very important for the teaching hour. I give you a moment of priesthood privacy. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Your responsibility is to examine your life in regard to personal sin and confess whatever is identified to you by the Holy Spirit. He's the convictor of sin. And then you're to confess it. You're to name it, cite it, state it to the Father, and it will restore you into the ministry of the Holy Spirit to teach you today out of the Word of God. 
Well, our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the opportunity to have the freedom to be able to speak openly and convictedly of the truth in our souls. We bring that, Father, today to this service. I'm thankful, Father, for the freedom, the national freedom, the personal freedom, the spiritual freedom that we have to assemble and study without distraction and get the revealed identity of the will of God in our personal life. I pray today, Father, as we come both by automobile to this study as well as the Internet, we would use the same classroom etiquette. We would stay focused for this hour of study and maximize it to our soul for in that we have the spiritual growth momentum uh, for time and eternity uh, manifested today in this lesson for we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm going to look at four aspects of Jesus' prophecy given to Peter in this final, truly, truly, on aging and dying. It's obviously, that's what he's talking about in this prophecy, is about aging and dying. And I, I'll show you four parts of this. And I, I'm, in, I'm in John 21, 18 and 19. And in point number one, I want to examine the uh, lesson text, that's verse 18 and 19, by the following four sections that I think is going to be important in this messianic doctrine of prophecy given to Peter that we can learn from. And I'm going to have eight doctrinal points. So pay attention to these eight doctrinal points on these two verses. That's going to be apropos for you and I. I see in this a younger section I see an older or aging section, I see a dying section, and I see a follow Christ section. That's the four things that I saw that was really important in verses 18 to 19 and 20. So let's go back to the text for a moment. Following, truly, truly, I say to you, here is the Messianic doctrines that's important. And then he goes a, a little bit and explains. First of all, he says, when you were younger, notice there is a younger now, what's interesting is the word when. It's hoten. Now, it, sometimes in English, they'll use the word when, and it just looks like when in English to you and I. But in the Greek language, they can use different words for when that tells you, uh, gives you a different avenue of thinking. And th this text has that. For example, when he says when here, when, and then he's going to have but when, Look, in the young section, he says, but when you were younger, drop down a little bit to the semicolon, but when you grow old. Now, in the English, that looks just like when. But in Greek, it's two different words. So this, this is what causes me to have section on young and a section on old. Okay? Now, when, the, when he introduces when you were younger, this is what we call hoten and the, hote, and this is an adverb of time. It's an adverb of time. And he says, now you remember when you were younger, you just pretty much ran your life the way you wanted. You, uh, you bought the clothes that you wanted to buy, you know, once you got your own paycheck, you know, your parents dressed you the way they wanted to dress you until a certain point. Maybe, maybe in your teens you began to have an input about what you would like to wear, and they, you know, they honored it to a point. They might say, hmm, skirt's just a tad bit short or whatever. And so there was some compromise, and that's a good training period for children. I'm so glad my mother, uh, she was very color-coordinated. Therefore, that has aided me as a boy because most boys, they don't care how it's... That's the shirt I like. That's the pants I like. That's good for me. And so in the real world of business and dating and all this other stuff, color coordination becomes an issue. Uh, so, but younger, you, 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 you wore the clothes, you dressed, you bought the clothes you liked, you clothed yourself... And you presented yourself. Notice how he says that. You used to gird yourself, that's clothe yourself, and walk wherever you wished. We all know that. 
We all know that. You began to make your own decisions. You were a young adult. You moved into adulthood. You began to make your own choices. Uh, you went off to college and did this and did that. And then now you're working. And we under all understand that. And so in this younger section, you were younger. You used to do this. And it's interesting because these are in the imperfect tense in the Greek language. The imperfect tense. This was something that you established and went through your parental training and then your early years of training and now you're an adult and you've established this in your life and that's this is who you this is who you became as far as dressing and going and doing what you want the choices you made in your life puts it in the imperfect tense it's kind of interesting then he comes to but when and notice I put over there I showed you that we have something unique now because hotan we have hotan H-O-T-A-N. And it is used with, with the subjunctive mood. Hoten is used with the subjunctive mood. In other words, this when, this timing is now connected with a subjunctive mood. So here's what it says. But when you grow old, and notice, notice I gave, you, gave that, uh, well, I don't, yeah, I did. Notice this is where you get the word aging and medically how you deal with people who are aging. It comes from this Greek word aging or older, older, older age, older age. And notice it's an aorist active subjunctive. When you enter in, he's saying, when you enter into this older age, see that's the when and that's the aorist tense. This is the way, in other words, there's two periods in your life. Jesus says there's two periods in your life. There's this early stage in your life when you're younger. And there's this other stage in your life that is older. When you're in the younger stage, you're in control of your life. You're doing pretty much what you want. You dress and eat and go and come and yada yada. But there's going to come a point when in your older age when it's going to require caregiving. Somebody else is going to have to help you, right? I know you don't want to think about that. I don't either. Who's going to dress me? I don't know. Not Billy. I don't want Billy. Dad, this is what will be comfortable, Daddy. Wear that. No, man, that don't look good. It don't have to be color-coordinated. You're too old to care about that. What do you care if you're color-coordinated? See? I got I to be color-coordinated, Billy. See? So, so he talks about that, and he puts it into this different win. When you enter into this aging process, you're going to become more and more dependent on someone else. Now, here's what I like, what Jesus said. See to someone, you will stretch out your hand and someone else. See that word, someone else? That's alas. And alas means somebody of the same kind. Ideally. Ideally, this means somebody in your family that cares about you the way you cared about them. If not, that alas means somebody that loves Christ the same way you love Christ. You know how to pick a, a good nursing home? He tells you. You know how to take care of the elderly in your family? He tells you. Now, I want you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Timothy. I don't know that this is on your paper. I want you to turn to 1 Timothy 5.4, and then I want 5.8. Because I'm going to tell you, now most of you know this, that come on a regular basis, but we have new people, and they have to be instructed. He's talking about widows 
we're talking about the elderly. And they fall in the same category. And he speaks to the children and grandchildren of the family. The children and the grandchildren of the immediate family. Let them first learn to practice piety in regard to their, that's righteousness. That's the, that's the, the, that's the work of the word of God, the Holy Spirit working out the directive will in your life in a specific area. Let them first learn to practice piety. And that interesting, first learn it in your home. Then you take it out. Isn't that interesting? Let them first learn to practice piety in regard to their own family and to make some return to their parents as well as grandparents. For this is acceptable in the sight of God. The first responders to the elderly in your immediate family is you. What happens if you've got brothers and sisters in your family and it comes time to take care of them and they go like, stick them in an old age home. Who cares? And you're the only one that cares. You know who takes care of them? You. You know what it's called? It's called practicing Learning first how to be a righteous person is in your family. Practicing righteousness, godliness. I've been through this, and I'm telling you it's important. There's two times... A person needs to have the family around him, birth and death. The birthing of a child needs family around it. And the aging and dying needs family around it. Doesn't need strangers. Neither one of them needs stranger care. They need family care. And it makes it very clear here how this is to be done. Look at verse 8. He goes on in this discussion, and then he comes back in verse 8. If anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. The King James calls him an infidel. That's the unbeliever on a low totem pole. That's an unbeliever. That, 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 that says that an unbeliever, the least of the unbelievers, show more respect to their elderly than you do, and you've been born again. You understand that? Which means that when the unbelievers see you show the righteousness in, in regard to the living out of the elderly people who need your assistance in life, they need it on that end just like children need it on the front end. It has a great witness to the world around them. It has an enormous, farther than you can imagine. You have no idea how far out that witness of the righteousness of God spans out from that exercise. The older section. Then he deals with the dying section. In verse 19. Back to our, our original passage in John. He comes back and he says. Sig that he was signifying. What, what manner. What kind of death he would die. And so we've gone from. Youth. To aging. To dying. And we know that process. And we know. Do you, know you, you know when you should begin to plan for this? 
You know when you should begin to plan for it? Now. Do you plan, listen, do you plan for your retirement? Do you, you know, that's aging. That's the sign that you've hit some kind of point of aging, right? Well, I'm retiring. We'll join, just come join the old people's uh, morning breakfast. We all hang out and talk about medicines and how boring life is. I don't. I can't stand that. So I pick my restaurants where they don't do that. But needless to say, that's what goes on. That drives me crazy. This dying section, signifying what kind of death, and the word death is thanatos, that's the, the dying of a believer, that he will glorify God, that he will glorify God. And what's interesting now, when he switches over to when, right, you're not there, but when you get there, Peter, this is going to be it. And he apparently was close to that, at least in Jesus' opinion. I don't know what age he was, but he was close to it. And, he, and he's signifying what kind of death. What kind of death. It's, it's just kind of important. And when he t gets there, he switched from the imperfect, when he was talking about when you were young, when you were young, this was your life. But now you're about to step into the, Old age, and when you do, you're headed to death, which is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. Neither one of these are bad. The old and the dying is no more than the birth and the growing. Neither of them are to be fearful. They're both wonderful parts of life. It is your attitude that screws it all up. It is your attitude. You need to stay on the page with the Lord on this subject matter. And so he deals with the dying section. And then follow the follow me section, the follow Christ section. And when he had spoken this, he said, follow me. Present active imperative, that's a command. Second person plural to him. Now listen to me. I want you to write this Bible verse on the side of your paper. I want you to write there. John 13, 19. Listen to what he tells. Now, he's about to go into this death picture himself. In John 13, 19, he's at the Last Supper. I mean the Last Supper. <laughs> this is his Last Supper. Do you understand what I'm saying? He's going to the cross. This is his Last Supper. Listen to what he says. Because he's about to step into the death zone himself. Listen to what he says. He said to his disciples, and this is what I'm telling you. John, I'm telling you John 13, 19. I am telling you this. I am telling you now before it happens. Now listen to me. You know why? Forewarned is forearmed. I'm telling you before this comes to pass. So that when it does come to pass, you will believe, you will know and believe that I am He. <laughs> you will know the reality of your relationship in Christ and the dynamics of how He works in your life. I am telling you about this subject matter, aging and dying, your responsibility within yourself and to your people. I am telling you this before it comes to pass so that when it comes to pass, you will know how to deal with it. You will be honorable with it because you will see the righteousness of Christ manifested from your life to other people's life and it goes out like a rippling effect to the world. That's a given. Here's a doctrinal point. Here's a doctrinal point for me. God has a plan for Peter's life. 
just like our life. At some point, and the younger you do this, are you 20? You got to listen to me. Are you about to step into 20? Oh, younger person. What I'm about to say that he said to Peter, I'm going to say to you because being forewarned is being forearmed. God has a plan for your life. God has a plan for your life just like he had a plan for Peter's life. Waiting to be accomplished. You're young now. And look, at you know when he says this? Peter has gone back to fishing, not feeding. Come on now. Had Peter gone back to fishing, not feeding? That's the whole conversation with Peter. Go back to feeding, right? At some point, listen, the younger you learn this lesson, at some point, what does, listen, what has God got for your life? I'll tell you what he's got for it. To walk by faith, to walk in the power of the Spirit. And when you do, he'll lead you right down the path he's prepared for you. If you're not willing to walk in the Spirit, if you're not willing to walk in faith, you will not walk down the path. At some point in your life, you've got to come to this place. And when you do, you will find the righteousness of God working your life in the most magnificent way. You'll stop talking about, oh, my life sucks. Oh, I hate my life. Oh, I wish I had. I wish I had. Quit looking for that. Listen, you, whatever you're wishing for, you have God that is greater. Oh, if I won the lottery. Oh, if I got this. Oh, if I got that. Where's that? Listen, you've dreamed all your life and got nothing. Try God for a while. Jeez. God has a plan for your life like Peter, waiting to be accomplished by walking by faith and not by sight. Think how much of the day you waste by walking by sight. Oh, I don't know what's going on. Oh, I wish I knew this. Oh, I don't know. Oh, I wish I knew. Oh, I don't know. I wish I knew. What are you doing? You're wasting your life. <laughs> you know, you're like the proverbial horse between two haystacks that dies of starvation. You can't make up your mind which one you... <laughs> Why are you doing that? Walk by... Yes, sight. You do know that's walking by sight. <laughs> the sight will kill you. You'll die of starvation. You walk by faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. You put it on God. You take, take it off from yourself and put it on God. Trust him. He said, I will provide. I will take care. I will do. I will do. I will do. Get your hands off from it. You're screwing your life up with bad decisions, and you're spending your life oh, 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 all wound up and geared up and, and all full of anxiety and worry. Why are you doing that? Why do you choose to walk by sight when you can walk by faith? Cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you in 1 Peter 5. Matthew, the sixth chapter. Why, how many times do I have to tell you? I've been telling you this for 40 some years. Why won't you believe it? Why don't you kick the monkey off of your back? Stop carrying this dead man around with you. God had a plan for Peter's life, just like yours and mine, waiting to be accomplished by walking by faith, not by sight. Listen to Peter's testimony. Listen to Peter's testimony. As he is walking into this aged period headed for the grave. You, you with me? Peter, when he writes 2 Peter, Peter is on the way. He is into that old age, and he is about to step in to the, to the grave business. And, and, and here's his testimony. Listen to this. 2 Peter 1, I'm trying to, forewarning you is forearming you. Look, 2 Peter 1, 13 through 15. Now, I'm just pulling out verse 14. 
the rest of it is well worth your reading. Listen, do you have elderly in your family? You have aging parents? You have, listen, grandchildren, you have aging grandparents? You got them on both sides? How about it, Billy? Got them on both sides? I'm trying to get to my family right now, and I, yeah, you need to make preparation. It's really good when you got your kids in here. Here is 2 Peter 1.14. Listen to this. Knowing that the laying aside of my dwelling, that's Peter's way of saying I, I'm about to die imminently. Eminent. In other words, he said, within a short period of time, I will be dead. I know it. God has made it clear to me that in his sovereign plan, I'm about to die. See, listen, you think he's not going to be as clear on that as he's clear on living? Is God not clear in your life about how you should live? What makes you think he's not going to be as clear? Death is a big deal for him, just like birth and living and dying. Birthing, living, and dying. These are three phases of God that he's all over. <laughs> Gosh, you must know that. He was his own son. Is that not true? Birthing, living, dying, all of that was important to God. It is to you and I. He's not really hot on, on the one and on the other and not on dying. Birthing, living, and dying. He's high on all of those. Stop that foolishness. And Peter is talking about this, that the laying aside of my dwelling, that is his concept of dying, is eminent as also, listen, look, look at that line, as also the Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. Now, when did he do that? When did he do that? Come on now, people. When did he do that? In John 21, 18 and 19. Agreed? in this great messianic doctrine that had prophecy with his name on it. And in that, that prophecy is extended to you and I in the, in the way God deals with birthing, living, and dying. And let me tell you, God's a champion of all three. There's not one part of this that God is not the champion of all of them. There's no fearing and birthing. There's no fear in, in living. There's no fear in dying because God is in control. Whew. Listen, that's Peter's testimony right out of the word of God. Point number two. This prophetic messianic doctrine also contained a final standing present command. When I say that, that follow me, that word follow is a present, active, imperative, second person plural. Now, let me tell you why that's important. That, that's called a standing command. In the military, there are standing commands that are always there. And there are hut two commands, heiress commands. It means, soldier, on your feet. Pick up your weapon. Here we go. I got you. You're on KP today. They don't do that anymore. How sad is that? How sad is that? Buddy, when I was in the military, we pulled KP. All you had to do is nothing. <laughs> oh, and he just walked in and looked at you. If you looked at him, he went, I'll take you. KP. Do I? Second person plural. He's talking to Peter. Follow me. It's a present tense. It's an active voice and it's imperative. The present tense, he's just speaking, it's a second person uh, singular. He, he's talking to him in the present tense, which is standing command. Follow me. And when did he say this? Right there in John 20. What, what's Peter doing? He's fishing, not feeding. He has left his calling, which was to feed. Jesus has called him back. Has he not called him back? He's called him back to fish, I mean to feed, right? And listen, let me tell you what it means in the bigger picture of Peter's life. 
It's the apostolic. Peter was a pillar of the apostolic ministry of establishing the church in the world. The book of Acts from chapter 1 to chapter 12 is all about Peter's apostolic ministry of establishing the church. He was the apostle to the Jew, to the church. From 13 and Acts to the end of the book, you have the apostle Paul's ministry, apostolic ministry to the church to bring Gentiles. He was the apostle to the Gentiles. When you get through the book of Acts, you have the church, the apostolic church in the world includes Jews and Gentiles as one in Christ. As well as more, Galatians 3.27. No longer male and female, no longer, you know, Jew and that, no, no longer slave and free. You know the story. You know the story. A standing command, follow me. In other words, he's saying, listen, Peter, come on back. Come on back. Come on back. Listen, when he says this to Peter, Peter has already recovered himself from the three denials. Peter has come back with his disciples. He's come back into the program, but he's fishing, not feeding. Jesus approaches Peter and says, you got another choice. You've come back. I like that. You've rebounded back. I like the fact that you've rebounded back. You've come on back, you confessed your sin, you've come on back. I like that. But what I don't like is the choice you've made between fishing and feeding. So I'm going to encourage you. He doesn't tell him, but there's a pretty sharp command here, right? Not a hut too. It's a present tense. I want, you to, I want you to return to do what you were called to do. I'm going to request you. I'm going to encourage you. I'm going to put a command on it. I want you to return to what you were originally called to be. And I want to take you from there into the most unbelievable ministry you could ever imagine. I'm going to take you from there, Peter, if you'll respond. I'm going to put you into an apostolic ministry where, greater, where you will connect with greater works. This is true for you and I. I mean, why are you, why are you settling to be humdrum, you know? Why do you settle for that? When God has a magnificent ministry for you, well, I don't know what it is. How is that possible? I can tell you. Listen, let me tell you. Let me tell you why I know you're on the right path, because you're sitting here today studying with me. The most wonderful thing that Peter did in recovering himself from his three denials of Jesus Christ. And it was a bitter, it was a bitter return, wasn't it? It was not an easy one for him, right? He wept bitterly, bitterly. He wept bitterly, but came home anyhow. Maybe like the prodigal son, wept bitterly and said, look, I not, listen, I need to go back. I need to go back. And he came back. Listen, you're, you're, in a, you're in a right situation because when he came back, he was in Bible study again. Listen, he was back into Bible study. Was he not back into Bible study? Listen, he left Bible study. He left the Word of God. He went out there, and he, he made a whole bunch of bad decisions. And Jesus, listen, and all he had to do to get back was confess him. 1 John 1, 9, he was back. But listen, back meant back into Bible study where Jesus challenges him again. I'm saying to you, you're in the right place at the right time for the right message. I'm saying to you, I'm saying to you, let God challenge you. Let the Lord Jesus challenge you. He's the head of the church. I'm just a spokesman. He's the head of the church, and he's challenging you. You do know that you're at the right place to be told that there is a ministry 
there for you. He had, listen, Peter had no idea. Jesus said, come back and follow me. He had no idea what following Jesus would mean that he would be the, have the enormous apostolic ministry of Acts 1 through 12. You should read that. You talk about coming back and fishing. That little, that little mess of fish he caught of 153 that broke the nets and burdened the ships and everything. What God gave him in chapters 1 through 12 was so far out there. Who could have ever imagined? That's what I'm talking about. Peter's not in a place where he can say to Peter right now, Peter, I'm going to make you one of the most phenomenal apostles the church has ever heard of. What he's interested in is Peter will make a second decision, and that is to come back and follow me to be a feeder because I've got to leave. I'm no longer the feeder in the world. You are. Why do you think Jesus is pressing you? He cannot do the work. He has called you to do his work. And you say, well, how do I know? It's wherever your life goes. If your life, wherever your life goes on Monday, wherever it goes on Tuesday, wherever it goes on Wednesday, wherever it goes on Thursday, and in that going and understand that I'm in that mode of ministry because God, I'm going to follow Christ. In that, he will begin to push you and, and put you into places of ministry you could have never envisioned. I remember flying into New York when I was with Mr. Graham. I flew into New York. It was late at night. I, I got what we used to call the red eye. It, it was dark and it was starting to light a little bit. It was still dark enough. When we came over New York City, that thing lit up. I could not believe. I looked out of the window. I was sat next to the wing. I looked out, and I saw, and I, I, you know, there was no way to count. I just saw lights, 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 and, and then lights would be popping on. And the Spirit of God said to my spirit, look down there. I said, yeah, that's... Whew. That's pretty big. And he said, We're going to get every home. I'm sending to you New York City to preach the gospel to every home. The year before, I had been on Pine Mountain praying that God would save 12 people. A little podunk kid out of Podunk, Michigan. I can't begin to tell you the overwhelming attitude that came over my life. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that God would send me to spearhead that ministry. Listen to me. Three years later, not only did we hold one of the massive, a massive crusade, and I can't begin to tell you how many different ways we evangelized before the crusade ever came. Usually, more people were saved before the crusade came than the actual crusade. 
because we all went out and spoke to civic groups and everywhere, and we gave invitations, I did, gave invitations to be saved. The Monsignor, I met with the Monsignor, had no idea who the Monsignor was other than the title. I walked right into his office, and he gave me New York. I had all of the seminary, young, young priestly seminary students working with me. How does that happen? Three years later, we not only did the crusade, we came back and put, it, put the crusade on television and reached ever home. You know how that happens? God. I would have, I could have never, ever imagined that when I was saved, when I was going through my training, when I was pastoring little churches, rural churches. I would have never envisioned that. See, God has a plan. God has a plan. You think, oh, not for me. Listen, I, I know what you're saying. I came from Podunk. I know that. I'm telling you that God has a wonderful, and you're in the right place for him to tell you. And so when he does it, listen, Christ is the, the one who reveals the great stories in your life. Peter had wonderful testimonies before and after. His fall from grace. Because the Lord is a forgiving, a forgiving person of second and third and fourth chances. Don't you think that God, well, I'm not educated, oh, I'm not this, I'm not that. Don't you go there. Don't you walk by sight. God has a magnificent plan for your life. All he's waiting for his use is salute and enter it. I'm telling you that for sure. And Peter is a, living example of that. Peter must reorient himself on the revealed directive will of God and his role in that plan. And when he chooses to become consistent in his walk by faith and not by sight, God will show things Peter in his life he never, never could have ever imagined. The plan of God calls for Peter to be an apostle to the Jew, to the church. In Galatians, the second chapter, 7 and 8, we are told that Paul was to be the apostle to the Gentile, and Peter was to be an apostle to the Jew. Listen to how it's described. He who effectually worked for Peter in his apostleship worked also for Paul, will also work for you. That word, effectual, is an interesting word because it's the English word energy or the, abil the ability to work at a high level opposed to low energy. And it refers to production. It means to set forth Energy power to do things that are great. Yeah, I've watched my grandson go into the gym and lift a few pounds. And then he lifts a few more pounds. Now he's lifting Volkswagens. It's a pretty amazing thing. It's called energy. It's energy producing power or production that mazes even yourself. That's that word effectual. That's that word effectual. It's used in 1 Corinthians 16, 9 in evangelism. It's used in Hebrews 4, 12 with the word of God. That same word, that same word is used with the gospel in 1 Corinthians 16, 9 and used with the word of God working in your life by the faith cycle. In Hebrews 4.12, where 
well, let's take a break here. We'll come back and finish our lesson that we've introduced to you in the first hour. After a word of prayer, and the men will take the offering. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the introduction to this lesson on aging and dying. And it's all about how we orient ourselves to the plan of God. Listen, the door is wide open. We're, we're familiar with that. It's all about choices. Boy, have these people made a good choice here today to come to Bible study, to have this reality, this forewarning, forearming in their life. I pray for our offering today, Father, that we would be good stewards as we give it and be good stewards as we spend it. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to have, I want you to remember two people that have lost loved ones that, um, you know, going through the transition period of loss. One is Mary who goes to our church. She lost her sister. I talked to her at halftime. She leaves at half and, um, she could, she could use our prayers, even though she has all the information that we have about seeing them again and all that. It's still, and then, of course, Bill Simmel. Those, those for sure. Um, Jason Golden, you know, need to be praying for that, that family. That, I tell you, Jason's had a wonderful, that family's had a wonderful ministry through their struggles and difficulties. They, had, they have had a great ministry. Um, then, of course, we got Tony and Claudia and uh, Frank and, and uh, Arita. Uh, these are people that are, you know, they're struggling. So remember them in prayer. Well, I'm back to my lesson with you on um, the aging and dying uh, we covered the first half in the first hour, and now we'll, we'll resume at point three on the discussion of uh, this final recorded, uh, truly, truly saying, a messianic doctrine of John in the book of John. And, and uh, he records that Jesus gave a special prophecy uh, to Peter. Uh, and here's point three that... Uh, of uh, things that we ought to think about, in my opinion. Uh, Jesus reminded Peter what categorical Bible doctrine, uh, the importance of it, uh, residing and functioning in his soul, and how important it will to his aging and dying to bring meaningful, to bring meaning to grace in his life. Um, you see, what Jesus gave him is what we call categorical doctrine. He told him in a revealed, in the, the revealed directive will of God, in that prophecy, he talked about his aging and his dying. Agreed? See, there's categories. One category was aging, the other category was dying. And he gave him specific information about it. And here's what's interesting to me. From the point that Jesus gave him this information, to the point of Peter's dying is going to require Peter not only to confess his sin to get back with the program, which he already did, right? But it's going to require Peter to make another very important choice in his life. What are you going to do with the rest of your life? What are you going to do with it? I mean, here you are. You're at, you're at a place, Peter. You're at a fork road in your life. You know that you're a capable fisherman and could go back to the fishing business and do well. No doubt about that. But I've called you to be a fisher of men and a feeder of those men. A feeder of the saved. That's what I've called you to be. And I would like you to be that person. The good part of this, in that we don't know what he did until we get to the book of Acts. We saw that he accepted the challenge, didn't he? He followed him. By following him, he didn't mean in a general way, but in this it was specific, wasn't it? I want you to go back and I want you to feed. 
And, and, and listen, he understood that. That meant being a pastor. I want you to go back and I want you to pastor the people. And, and Peter, in the, in the, when he writes 1 Peter, the fifth chapter, looked at that for a moment. I'll show you the dynamics of this, what this meant to his life later when he writes about it. He's, he, he, this is like saying, oh, I'm so glad I went back to my calling. I didn't go the fishing. I could have went fishing. I'm glad I didn't. I'm glad that I went back and became a shepherd of the sheep of Jesus Christ. Listen to what he says. I'm in 1 Peter 5, and he talks about shepherding. Therefore, I exhort, exhort the elders, that is the leader, the, the pastoral leaders of the church, the elders among you as your fellow elder, see, felder, elder, and witness of the suffering of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. Now, listen to what he, he's talking to the elders as a fellow el elder, agreed? Now, look what he challenges himself and them with. You see, he's connected himself with the pastor teachers of the church. He calls them elders because that's another title of a pastor teacher. That's a title of office type of thing. A fellow elder, I speak to the elders as a fellow elder, shepherd the flock of God, of God among you, shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight. And then he goes into a whole discussion of this. And then in verse 4, he goes in a whole discussion of what that means. And then in verse 4, he says, when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. You know where he got all that kind of stuff? Got it from this whole deal in, in John 21. See, Christ called him as a disciple, made him an apostle. And Peter, Peter became a shepherd and is telling other, other pastor people to shepherd and how to shepherd them. Where did he get that title? He got it because the word shepherd is the word meaning feed my sheep. That's where he got it. And Peter is saying, I'm so thankful. I am so thankful that I, I, I responded when that challenge, when he said, follow me to be a feeder of my sheep. I am so, because that meant to be a shepherd. I am so thankful I did that. And he's telling the other ones, this is an honorable calling. And, uh, and, it, and it will pay off in eternity, didn't he? He goes on to talk about that, about the crown that's connected with it. Well, I just find that to be of interest. Uh, and, and listen, you're never going to find that place where God had... Listen, and Peter is no exception to the rest of us. God wants us to find that, that niche in our life that we can fulfill that plan of God that in our calling, everybody has one. It's not the same. We're gifted different. We have a whole different project in the plan of God, but everybody has it. Every per, everybody in here is gifted in ministry in the church. Um, but, but so but here's how you get there. You got you if you don't buy into Philippians 121, it won't happen. Philippians 120, 120 Philippians 121 says, for me to live is Christ, and then to die is gain. You see, there's a first and a second. What he said to Peter is, let's get into the first part, and the second part will be a piece of cake. If you, if you learn to live for Christ, then dying is gain. See, I, I find that to be just insightful into your life. So that's kind of what Peter had to do. Listen to Job 14.5. I don't think this is on your paper unless you put it there. Job 14.5. He talks about your days, your months, and his limits. His boundaries. Since his days are determined, the number of his month is with you, his limits you have so that 
You cannot pass. I mean, just think about that. I mean, who even considers that God cares about your days? Listen, here's what this means. That he has cared about you in eternity past so that when the day you were born, he took interest in your days. You're one day old. You're 12 days old. Then we're into months. You're one month old. Now we're into years. You're one year old. You know who cares about all that? God. You know who set all this up? Did you know who set up the time you would be born into the world? And who cares about every one of your days? Every one of them. You say, well, I say to people, what's, the wor what's one day you hate worst of all? You know what most people say? Monday. I figure that must be Monday if they had a great weekend. They didn't want it to end. Maybe they don't like their job. I don't know. But when you ask people, it's interesting what day. They, everybody seems to have a day they don't like. A, week, a weekday. Seems like everybody likes Friday. That makes sense, doesn't it? I guess that's why they don't like Monday. <laughs> I don't know. But Job 14.5 is interesting anyhow. And what should, what should we know about who's taking care of all the days of my life? I mean, you have a hard time. Listen, we know we didn't do a good job yesterday. And we know we're struggling today. But listen, when you learn that none of these days, they're all a gift to you. Every day that you have is a gift to you. And he reminds you that, for example, when he says to pray, and he says, our daily bread. Not our weekly bread. Our daily bread. You know who's in charge of all this? Not only is he in charge of the day, but he's in charge of the bread. Wouldn't it be good to, wouldn't it be good to believe that? Yes, it'd be nice to believe that. Hebrews, here's one, Hebrews 13, 5. This is important about he holds... The days, he holds the month, the boundaries. I mean, isn't it good that the government can't vote that a week is 10 days? Now, you know, somewhere it's never dawned on them that they could do that. Because, because if they ever thought they could do that, they would do that. But somehow, God, listen, God has put a, a limit. When they got to Social Security, it was all based on the age of people dying. They knew they were never going to have to pay for it. Because a small percentage ever lived to 65. They were dying at 47 and 50. But it hasn't dawned on them that they could do that. And what kind of revolt would it be if they tried it? Hebrews 13, 5. I mean, he's in charge. Guess what Hebrews... It, it, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. But you know who's promised to... They don't, listen. You know, no human could give you that promise. The one who had, the one who could say it probably would be the one person you shouldn't trust. <laughs> I will, you know, when we used to marry people, they would actually say, until death do us part. You know, they quit that doing that. Well, you couldn't get anybody, you couldn't hold a gun at their head and get them to say that. Do you take this man to be this? Yeah, I'd pull a gun and hold him dead. Will you say I'll tell death to his part, just shoot me now. They, not going in with that tag on it, God might actually hold me to that. 
Or how about Psalms 37, 25, and 26? Here's what you ought to be able to see before you die. I have never seen the righteous forsaken. Let me tell you something. I've been in this. I've been in the ministry a long time. I have never seen the righteous forsaken. Listen to me. Because if I ever did, I would be required to be sure it was taken care of. Did you hear that? Because if I did see somebody, it would be my responsibility to try to help them. Here's a doctrinal point. Your past failures. Now listen to me. Listen to this point real clearly now. I'm at point three. This is called the fifth doctrinal point of my lesson. Your past failures do not define you nor your life now in Christ. Don't let the devil lie to you anymore. This for this day for say in your mind, say in your mind, this day forward, I'm not going to let him lie to me one more time about my past failures. My past failures do not define who I am today in Christ. See, Peter had that. Peter denied him. And Peter came back and he said, listen, where have you been, son? Peter did not let his past failures define who he was. He allowed his relationship with Christ to define who he was. Don't let the devil lie to you. This is an important point. Do not give in to the cosmos diabolicus lie of the devil. Listen, if there's anyone could have said that, it would have been David in Psalms 51, and he never said it. In this whole deal with Bathsheba, his past failures, your past failures do not define who you are in Christ today. Don't let them lie to you. Oh, you're a slug. You Look, you've done this, you've done that. He's a liar. He's the father of lies. His nature is to lie. God is the opposite. Listen to God for a while. Stop listening to the devil lie to you. Your past failure, listen, only your failures today define you. Your past don't. Listen, when you confess them, they're gone. As far as the east is from the west. I mean, you ought to give me a hua. You know what that is? Listen to me now. It's the power of God's forgiveness. It's the power of God's forgiveness. That's the story of 1 John 1 9 connected to 1 John 1 7. In 1 John 1 7, it's the cleansing of salvation. In John 1, 9, it's the cleansing, cleansing of sanctification. Be sure you understand that because what binds that all together is this wonderful forgiveness of God over sin because of the work of Christ on the cross. And he has to be justice. Always serve justice and righteousness on your behalf. What a wonderful thing. Listen, Colossians, you ought to write this down. Colossians 2.14. Forgiveness of all my transgressions. Listen, you've been forgiven of transgressions you haven't committed. They've already been taken care of as soon as you confess them. Here's the sixth doctrinal point. Confession of sin. And the change of the mind about your life in Christ versus your life in the world 
makes two things really possible. It makes possible for Peter to have a life of impact for God in the world. That's apostolic. It makes it possible for Peter to engage in greater works of God. I wrote scriptures down for you. It's going to cause Peter to be able to set your mind on things above and not on things below. Because when he denied Jesus, his mind was focused on things below and not things above. And he, when he confesses the sin, he's able to get back with his mind on things above and not on his mind on things below. What brings you to this church today? What brings you to church today? Either your mind was on things above and it brought you for spiritual reasons or your mind was on things below and it brought you for carnal reasons. And only you know it and only you can correct it. But it should be corrected. It should be corrected. You, got, you came with a hand out or a hand up. Begging or praising. Point number four. When Jesus gave Peter his personal prophecy, he spoke from his own personal experience. Don't miss that. Because when he gave Peter this prophecy, he had already died on a cross, was already buried, already raised from the dead, and headed back to the, to the Father in what we call the ascension. When Jesus laid this prophecy out to Peter, he had already gone through it himself. Listen to me. And Peter knew it. Peter knew that Jesus had died on the cross. Peter knew he had been buried for three days. And Peter knew that he had been raised from the dead. And Peter knew that he was going back to the Father. so do you so what do you struggle with if all of that's true and it was what do you struggle with about all of that it's about surrendering to what you know to be the revealed truth to your life so what was Jesus doing with Peter on the one hand he was reminding him of what he already knew that he ought to bring into practicality by faith. I mean, this, this stuff you know. What if I told you today that you didn't know? I told it to a different way, a different slant, a different this. You've not heard anything today you didn't know. That's not the point. The point is you need to put it into practice. I mean, what you know has to be believable. It's believable when you do it. That's the difference. Paul says the real danger that many in the church have is they get all puffed up with knowledge and not with practical experience of it. 1 Corinthians 8. Jesus reminds Peter that he must return to spiritual maturity and maintain that until he dies. I want you to go back to feeding my sheep. I want you to feed them until you die. You know, we have a tough call in pastoral ministry. We have a tough call. Peter says, the call I got from Christ is the call I extend to you in 1 Peter 4. 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4, right? I just read that. He says to the elders, as a fellow, as a fellow elder... I speak this truth to your life, a truth that's f for me. And, and he said, I learned this from Christ. I don't know how many times a week now I hear people say to me, when are you going to retire, Ron? when there's no more sheep to feed. 
when the guy who's caring for him, he won't take me to where I can feed him. Right? It says that will happen, right? And take you where you don't wish to be. They go like, no, I'm not taking you to church. They take me to church so I can stand up and preach. Hold me. I, I don't have any options. I have none. Oh, I could. I've come this long. I'm not going to belly up and roll over now. Run the race, run 26 miles, and then you, get, you can actually see it. I'm, I'm going to get there if I have to crawl over it. I give it up. Listen to what Paul said. Paul said, I fought the good fight. I finished the course. You know how you know when the fight's over, there's no more rounds. Either you're not able to get back up for the bell, or he's not able to get up for the bell, or there's no bell. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. We know when you finish the course. Listen, he doesn't tell you what kind of grade you got. He just says, did you finish? That's how we run the School of Biblical Theology. We don't give grades. We ask, did you finish? Wish I'd have had a seminar like that. Confession of sin. Oh, I did that. Doctrinal point. Hey, let me write this one down. I gave you Paul's testimony. I've kept the faith. There, in the future, look at all the F words. In the future, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who love his appearing. That's Paul's testimony. Let's write this down. I ain't got time to read it. But write down 2 Peter 1, 12 through 15. Read Peter's testimony. You, you will want to hear Peter's. The seventh doctrinal point, categorical Bible doctrine inhaled and exhaled by the faith cycle will close the soul in time and eternity. Don and I were talking at halftime about how, you know, people say you can't take anything out of, the, out of this world, right? You know, gold, silver, precious stones, automobiles, whatever. But you know, the one thing you can't take is the eternal word of God. The eternal word of God, right? The eternal word of God. You know, you know where you carry it? You carry it in your soul. It is good for time and it's ready for eternity. Second Corinthians, third chapter, two through eight, or Colossians 3, 12 through 17, which is not on your paper. Peter's final doctrinal point to us today is grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory for now and to the day of eternity. Whew. Let's close in prayer. Then we'll, uh, after that, Rick will pledge us out. Well, our Father... We've looked at aging connected to dying. We've looked at youth, aging and dying. And you know where the command was? Follow me. Follow me in your youth. Follow me in your aging. Follow me through death. He told that to Peter again. And Peter knew that Jesus had died, was buried and raised from the dead. And he says, follow me. Follow me. Follow me. Follow me, Peter, all the way till we see, our, see, see us, until we see ourselves again. Until we meet again. Follow me. I just thankful for it, Father. I'm so thankful for understanding this. I pray, Father, that 
we would be good, good stewards of this biblical information. In Jesus' name, amen.